what we will get if we allow CBDCs. It will be a Soviet-style economy because central bank digital currencies, I mean, it's, it's, it's a misnomer, really. They're trying to confuse people with this CBDC acronym already, suggesting, oh, and then saying it's the digital aspect that's new. We've been using BDC for decades, bank digital currency. And the digital aspect is nothing new. We've been using that, and it works okay. You know, it's not usually the biggest problem we have in finance and banking is, you know, the, tr you know, the transactions. So, um, you know, we've been using BDCs. So what is new? The C, the centralization aspect. So if they manage to introduce CBDCs, if it is inevitable, as some say, how will it end in 10, 20, 50, or 100 years? It is a completely dystopian scenario, and certainly in much shorter time than a century. Absolutely. I mean, just within a decade, I would say. And so we should stop it in the tracks. That's a very important point. It's so dire that we should not even allow pilot projects. I'm Oscar Wendell with MCH Global, and honored to have the arguably the most, what shall we call you? <laughs> Controversial economist of our time, inventor of quantitative easing, and today the foremost expert in CBDCs, I would say, and we'll be having a discussion this evening on CBDCs primarily. Well, I suppose economics in this day and age is more emotional and political more than being a science, and that's where the yes, sensitivity lies. Exactly. And so the reality, of course, is that economics is always about money and power. And that's precisely why the mainstream has neither of them in them. There's, there's not even money in these economic models, certainly not banks either. And also power is considered, no, we, we can't mention that. Um, so when the 2008 banking crisis happened, of course the journalists you know, want to interview some experts. Well, let's ask the professors of economics at Harvard University, MIT, you know, please comment. I mean, banks are going bust, stock markets are collapsing, companies are going bust, uh, the economy is shrinking, crisis, recession, unemployment. You know, please comment what happened. Well, the honest answer would have been by all these professors of economics, Harvard, MIT, Oxford. Well, sorry, I can't comment. Well, why not? Why can't you comment? You're the expert. Well, I don't have banks in my models. And this is what's even true for the central banks. And even today, most central banks use these dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which all sounds very scientific, um, but it's just smokescreen, it's just rhetoric, because it assumes general equilibrium, which, I mean, what's the probability of having equilibrium even in one market? Um, they, Essentially, they need eight assumptions at least to hold at the same time. You know, the axiom of the rational utility maximizer that doesn't care about others, can't be influenced by others, can't be influenced by advertising. Google, of course, doesn't exist in this world, you know, and av advertising doesn't work in this, in this world. In fact, the world is empty because we all died as babies because nobody cares about anyone else. Um, it's just, you know, it's, just, it's an insane theoretical world. And then you add assumptions that you admit aren't true Perfect information, complete markets, uh, perfectly flexible, instantaneously adjusting prices, you know, infinite life, blah, 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 keep going. Now, if all these assumptions hold, then you have equilibrium in one market. <laughs> but even if you, I mean, these, these economists, they, they, they pride themselves on using mathematics to pretend to be scientific, but they haven't even done their basic calculations. Because if you're generous and you assume that, uh, let's say that one of these assumptions has a probability of being true of, say, yeah, it's more likely to be true than not, so more than 50%, 55%, which is wildly um, you know, uh, optimistic. If you've got eight assumptions, what is the probability that you get equilibrium? All eight have to hold at the same time. It's joint probability. You've got to multiply the 0.55 you know, to the power of eight. So what is it? It's 0.8%. <laughs> but the individual probability is not 55%, it's more like um, zero. So we are talking about the reality, the real world just has no equilibrium. And then it's talking about general equilibrium, that means all markets. 
at the same time in equilibrium. I mean, it's, it's such a fictional world. So central banks, even, in their models, don't have banks in them. They don't have money in them. Um, so, you know, it's, that's the sort of extreme um, crazy world <laughs> that economists create. And then if you're just interested in reality, as I've always been, ready as a student, then that's considered, you know, rocking the boat and highly heretic and, yeah, very controversial. So, <laughs> Well, you're you rocking the, the boat where the power <laughs> lies and the balance of power is shifting. I want to talk about that with CBDCs and how it will impact the role of banks and the role of governments. Of course, in a reality where we don't have equilibrium, we have rationing. And rationing means demand is not equal to supply in every market. And that means the short side principle applies, which means the shorter of demand or supply determines the outcome. That's the common denominator. That's the only thing that can be traded. The shorter, the smaller quantity of demand or supply. And the short side has power. And suddenly power is in every market. Because the short side can pick and choose with who to trade. And there's tons of examples in any market. I mean, labor market is perhaps the most obvious one, but it's true for every market. It's even true for liquid deep markets like bond markets. You know, when you've got to sell your bond portfolio under stress, um, you realize, oh, well, I've got Turkey, 2037, 9.5%. Um, that's exactly what you're selling, you see. It's a very discreet, specific government bond. You need a buyer exactly for that bond. And, you know, it may take a while. So where's the equilibrium? Um, so the short side is power. And, of course, the fundamental... Um, um, tool that everyone needs to use is money. And with money, what is the short side and what is the long side? What do you think? Which is larger, the demand for money or the supply of money? Any, any guess? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think, What's your feeling? I think that uh, up until your intervention, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, up until then probably the demand was higher than supply. That's why. The demand surely is higher than supply. Because money is so useful. Obviously for philanthropic and, you know, good projects. <laughs> but we all would like to have more money because it gives us more, you know, possibilities and things to do and implement our ideas. So the demand for money is essentially infinite. And the, therefore the short side is the supply. Okay. So who's supplying the money? I did a survey in Frankfurt... Um, and, and my students helped me. Um, my courses started to get very large. I mean, I had this optional course initially, 50 students, but by the fifth semester, it was 450. Everyone signed up. So I sent them out on the streets, and we did the survey. Um, over 1,000 questionnaires, so it's quite statistically quite relevant. And the question was, who do you think creates the majority of the money supply and allocates this money supply in the economy? And of course, multiple choice, you know, make it easier. And the outcome was that 84% of the people polled, which is probably above average education you know, in central Frankfurt, um, thought that the money is created by the government or the central bank, which is a very reasonable answer. It's just not true. Governments create zero money. There's some tiny, tiny exceptions. Um, if you're interested, we can talk about those. But governments don't create money. They borrow money at interest. That's why we have this national debt um, in most countries. And central banks, well, they only create 3 or 4% of the money supply. Who creates the 97% of the money supply? Well, you mentioned them. It's the banks. But that's been a well-kept secret for centuries. Initially, it was well-kept because both parties in the bank activities um, had an interest in keeping it secret, because until 350 years ago, all over Europe, usury was forbidden in Europe. And actually many parts of the world, and perhaps even most parts of the world, charging interest was illegal, and therefore everyone involved kept it quiet. Now that played into the hands of the banks because they could keep their business model uh, quiet as well which was not to lend money. Economists say banks are deposit-taking institutions that lend money. And the reality, you have to remember, 
is almost always the exact opposite of what the mainstream economists tell you. So the, the reality is banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. At law, it's very clear, particularly if you take English law, which was created together with modern banking to suit modern banking in the 17th century with the creation of the Bank of England. And English law is very clear cut on this. Banks don't take deposits because the concept of a deposit at a bank doesn't exist at law. It doesn't exist. It is simply, and you know, the, the courts are very clear on this, it is simply a loan that you give to the bank. You're just a general creditor. There's no such thing as a deposit. It's not a deposit in any sort of sense that we use it. It's not held in custody. It's not a bailment. You know, it's not warehoused. No. It is a loan to the bank. So, banks don't take deposits. But surely banks lend money. No, they don't. They're in the business of purchasing securities. Because when you take a loan, the loan contract you sign, at law, is a promissory note that you've issued. And the bank is buying that. Now, the bank owes you money, which means it will make a record of its debt to you, which we call bank deposits. And then you say, well, I don't care about these details. Just give me the money when you borrow the money. And the banker will say, you'll find it in your account if they're careful. They may say, we've transferred it to your account. That would be wrong. Because once you get into your account, when you take a bank loan, and I could show this. This is the first empirical study of how banks actually work. I mean, imagine this. I mean, this is so typical for economists. They've been arguing for, in, in the modern era, at least for the, the past 120 years, between three theories of banking. The currently dominant one is the financial intermediation theory, which says that banks gather deposits, do their analysis, credit rating, and credit, and, you know, um, risk assessment, all that, and then give out the loan. They're just intermediaries, like non-banks. It's the same thing. And then there's the fractional reserve theory, which is a bit older, which says each bank is a financial intermediary, but in aggregate, something strange happens. Banks create money. And then there's a third theory, the oldest, which says credit creation theory. Banks create money. And when a bank gives a loan, it newly creates money out of nothing, which seems a bit you know, hard to believe. And of course, has been made fun of quite a lot by followers of the other schools, but you get famous people supporting you know, each of these three schools. Some, like Keynes, support all of them sequentially. Um, Keynes, you know, starting with the credit creation theory, then fractional reserve theory, and then the financial intermediation theory, sort of chronologically in the way they've been pushed out. Anyway, so I thought this is crazy. But let's this is what your research uh, proved, right? Exactly. So let's use the scientific research methodology I mean, that's the scientific thing to do. Let's test the three theories. And they differ in the question of when the loan is given out, where does the money come from? The financial intermediation theory says it comes from deposits. The fractional reserve theory is slightly complicated, but essentially says it comes from reserves held at the central bank, excess reserves. And then the credit creation theory says it doesn't come from anywhere. It's newly created out of nothing. And then it's often polite to put this in Latin, ex nihilo because then it sounds like something's happening out of nothing, okay? Anyway, so, but what's the, you know, what's the scientific thing? Do a test. So I managed to do this, you need a bank, and that, of course, was a bit of a um, uh, constraint, but I found a bank, and we could do the test, and the conclusion was, of course, as, as, as you know by now, banks create money out of nothing. And so when you take out that loan, and it's, um, the money is given to you. It's booked into your account at the bank because that's a record of the bank's debt to you from the, arising from the loan contract. It's essentially an accounts payable liability that the bank now represents as a different type of liability called customer deposits in common usage. At law, it's just a loan to the bank. So really, you are lending the money to the bank that the bank's lending to you. But anyway. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. The banks create the money out of nothing. But that, that money represents value as a ledger, what's in the value in the economy. And exactly. Uh, we can use it for all the transactions. <clears throat> if there's no value that's being traded, the, uh, the money is worth nothing. And now that central banks are coming in with uh, CBDCs, how does that change the role of the banks? Money creation takes place when the banking system, central bank and banks, 
inject money into the non-bank economy. That didn't take place at that time, so you can't get inflation from this. Um, they didn't do QE2, the second type at that time, but they did it in March 2020. So I'm on the record on my Twitter accounts saying, well, I got the data around May 2020, this must create inflation, there's absolutely no doubt, significant inflation, double-digit inflation. 18 months later, I said, and it's exactly what happened. Because now, this is the second type of QE for the, for the reflation policy, money creation policy, when you have deflation. The central bank purchases non-performing assets from, uh, sorry, performing assets from non-banks, you shift the non, so performing assets from non-banks, in other words, normal companies. Corporate bonds. I mean, in Tokyo, I suggested real estate because Tokyo is not very green and they had this massive implosion in the banking system and the economy shrinking. Central bank can just buy real estate, supports the real estate market. Of course, these sellers, they're not banks, not, not many, not that many anyway. Um, so the, the accounts, their accounts at the banks are credited um, by the central bank, that bank reserves go up, but the banks create the deposits, money creation, credit creation. That's how you reflect the economy. And so this is what central banks have done. They've created this inflation intention. Now, how do we know that the March um, 2020 policy to purchase assets from non-banks, huge amounts of corporate bonds and all sorts of you know, um, purchases were actually the implementation of the BlackRock plan? How do we know that for sure? Well, look it up. Announcement by the Fed, March 2020. Yeah. We're hiring BlackRock to buy assets <laughs> from the economy. <laughs> it's not a secret. It's not a conspiracy. And, and the plan was, from start to finish, to create inflation. And that's what they did. And that's effectively, depending on perspective, and of course, or transfer of wealth. Of course. I mean, inflation <laughs> is a transfer of wealth. And, and that's so, not a very original <clears throat> idea. I, I mentioned the quote from Lenin earlier that the way to crush the bourgeoisie is between the millstone, of grinding them between the millstone of inflation and taxation. Uh, it's always been the case that governments try to use inflation. Yes, of course, there's a few more millstones, um, you know, because central banks are also very good at creating these boom-bust cycles and, and big recessions, um, which is another way of transferring ownership, you know, creating bankruptcies and uh, distressed assets and so on. I show in my book, Princes of the Yen, that the entire boom period of the 80s, which was massive, excessive credit creation by banks for asset purchases, which must create a bubble and must create a banking crisis afterwards, was done on purpose by the Bank of Japan. And they had a plan, and you know the details are on the book, Princes of the Yen. Um, and that's proven with eyewitness testimonies. Um, the data, I managed to get all the data, um, primary sources, secondary sources, and has never been disproven, has been out there since it was a bestseller in Japan in 2001. Um, and that's turned out to be the standard case that we have these central planners creating crises intentionally, which initially, I mean, you, you just you know, don't want to believe it. It's hard to believe. But of course, once you, you're over that, but by you know, looking at the evidence, and, and again and again, in, in almost every country, you get examples for that. That's now the sort of background. Now, with this background, that's when we should discuss CBDC. So the central planners are now coming out, and they dare to say, hey, give us more power. We want even more powers. Now, in my book, uh, the <coughs> New Paradigm in Macroeconomics, 2005, I warned of the recurring banking crises, and also the fact that after each banking crisis and economic crisis, we're giving the central planners more power. Because they will argue, oh, it's because, you know, things got you know, wrong. Obviously, we were trying to do the opposite. We're trying to have stable growth, stable prices, stable currency, stable everything. Oh, it just didn't quite work out. We didn't have enough powers. And for some reason, that seems to always convince. And there's a boom and bust cycle. But isn't there an advantage with uh, sort of spurring on creative destruction by by having a rejuvenation of companies, only the strongest surviving and uh, capital being allocated to the ones that are the most interesting in terms of short-term innovation? Well, I would argue that you get this, sh this innovation and, and, and we have this creativity and people are creative. 
um, without the very destructive resource misallocation and waste that comes from the boom bust cycles and you know bankruptcies is that's definitely not the most efficient way of running the show right how you run the show efficiently and create a lot of prosperity was shown by the east asian high growth economies and they've demonstrated it is possible to have double digit economic growth for decades and how do you do that well you know, in my quantity theory of disaggregated credit, I show basically once you understand banks create money, there's only three scenarios. If banks create the money, bank credit creation, and it's used for purchasing ownership rights, usually property is the biggest example because that's also um, essentially supported, subsidized by the Basel capital adequacy banking rules. So banks love to do property lending, but it can be financial assets, can be any asset. When you do the asset credit creation, because the lending is money creation, this must do something. Money creation always has an effect. So when banks lend for property, because it's money creation, it's like printing money and pumping it into the property market. Now, you don't have to study economics and have a PhD to then uh, conclude that, hmm, what's, what's this going to do with property prices? <laughs> Obviously, they're going to go up. They're driven by the money creation because it's not transferring money from A to B, which is a zero-sum game, and that it's new money that didn't exist before pumped into the property market, of course property prices go up. And then you get these boom-bust cycles. That's scenario one, when banks create credit for asset purchases, which is not part of GDP, by the way, um, because there's no, you know, GDP is a, is a um, value-added concept. Yeah. And by just transferring ownership of rights, well, you're not creating value. You're not, uh, therefore, it's not part of GDP. That explains some other puzzles like velocity decline and so on. Um, anyway, and then bank credit for GDP transaction, we've got two scenarios. Namely, if bank credit is used for consumption, because bank credit is always money creation, always. Banks never act as intermediaries. It's always net new money that's added to the economy, that's added to the money supply that didn't exist before. So if consumer loans go up, that means, of course, demand goes up. Effective <coughs> spending on consumer goods immediately goes up. But you haven't done anything about increasing the quantity of goods and services. So what must happen to consumer prices, and that's what we've seen since March 2020, inflation, consumer price inflation. Now, the, th the third possibility is the redeeming feature of banking, and then um, we can talk about solutions and also alternatives to the CBDC project. The redeeming feature of banking is when banks create credit for productive business investment to implement new technologies, to increase productivity, to implement these creative ideas that people have. I mean, technology is a recipe, like a cooking recipe. You know, it tells you what ingredients to choose, in what quantities, and then what process to use to get something that has higher value than just the sum of the costs of the inputs, right? Because of this clever idea, which is encompassed in this, in this process, in this technology, whatever it may be. So when you do that, you fund the implementation of new technologies, you are creating value added, and therefore it's not inflationary. You have more demand from the money creation, but you're also delivering more and higher valued goods and services. And that's how you get high economic growth. If you make sure that bank credit is used for productive business investment. And that's what they did in Japan, in Korea, Taiwan, and China. I mean, China is the, is the key example because well, it was most recent. And also because they moved from a Soviet style economy where they had what we will get if we allow CBDCs. It will be a Soviet-style economy because central bank digital currencies, I mean, it's, it's, it's a misnomer, really. They're trying to confuse people with this CBDC acronym already, suggesting, oh, and then saying it's the digital aspect that's new. We've been using BDC for decades, bank digital currency, and the digital aspect is nothing new. We've been using that, and it works okay, you know. It's, not usually the biggest problem we have in finance and banking is, you know, the, tr you know, the transactions. So, um, you know, we've been using BDCs 
So what is new? The C, the centralization aspect. It's the umpire, the referee saying, I want to join the game. Because CBDCs is having an account at the central bank. It's ripping up the 300 plus years implicit agreement that's existed between banks and the central bank. That central banks are the banks of the banks. And the public deals with the banks, but not the central bank. It's a two, two sort of layer um, financial system. But now the central banks are saying, the central planners, well, we want to have direct access to the public, which means they're going to compete against the banks. Now, what do you think when the umpire decides to join the game? I mean, is that a fair game? Just think of football. Use the red card, the whistle, the yellow card, and the umpire scores the goals, you know? <laughs> it's, it's unfair competition, absolutely. It also explains probably these mysterious policies by the central planners, certainly in the last, in the last three decades, which were very anti-bank, if we now realize actually their plan has been, I mean, these are long-term plans, to compete against the banks. Well, they have a huge conflict of interest. And then they shouldn't be bank regulators because they're going to hurt the banks. That's exactly what they've done. You know, since the introduction of the youngest major central bank, the ECB, 5,000 banks have disappeared. The Federal Reserve has killed almost 10,000 banks in, in the la last 35 years. That's what they're doing. They're consolidating the system. So let's look at the extreme case. We're going to get when we introduce CBDCs, ultimately, we'll drive banks out of business because you then just need the next banking crisis, which is very easy to arrange for the central planners. They've been very good at that. And then, of course, oh, um, well, there is CBDC now. The banks, well, they're you know, a bit you know, in crisis. What are you going to do? Everyone shifts their money to the central banks, banking system, you know, switch off the lights, pull the plug, it's gone. And then we have, what we then have is the Soviet-style system. You know, the Soviet Union is the dream of central planners. There was only one bank, Gosbank, the central bank. They had many branches, but there was only one bank. This is what the central planners are really adoring and envying. And, and of course, in the West, they've always had, you know, in the last 40 years, this China envy as well. But the truth is, China did the opposite. 45 years ago, um, when Deng Xiaoping came to power, it started out being a Soviet sort of, you know, the Mao um, economy with more or less, you know, just one bank. And then Deng Xiaoping came to power and he, and actually I started out talking about the inductive and deductive approaches, the theory, abstract, ideology, and then reality. And Deng Xiaoping actually, when he came to power and gave his first major speech, he talked about that. He says, listen, comrades, don't we want success? Don't we want a strong economy? Don't we all want to get wealthier and have a strong China? I mean, that's good for everyone, including CCP, you know? So yeah, everyone agreed. Well, let's ditch the ideology. That's literally what he said. Let's forget about the ideology. Let's see what works. There's a Chinese saying. Um, Seek truth from facts is one of those famous four character, you know, you can draw it with your brush. Qi Qi, 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 I think it is, but my Mandarin is not, <laughs> not that good. Uh, it's easier in, in, in Japanese. Qi Qi, Qi Se. And seek truth from facts is the inductive um, methodology. You know, you, you look at the facts, at the data, and so what he did is he traveled to Japan first thing, because there was a country with a single party state, you know, the, the LDP having been in power, and that's still true. I mean, the exception of three years in the entire post-war era, one party. So, you know, for somebody coming from communist China, it's kind of, okay, let's see how they do it. <laughs> and, and he did say in public when he traveled to China, I've come to you to seek the elixir of high growth. Now, that was a reference the Japanese immediately understood because there was this legendary figure, like a thousand years before, this Chinese um, sage coming from China to Japan. The land of the rising sun is how the Chinese call it. Because, you know, you've got to be in the West to see Japan as the, the land where the sun rises, right? It wasn't the Japanese coming up with this name. 
Anyway, so the sage came to the land of the rising sun and was seeking the elixir of life at that time. And that's a famous story and maybe true, but, you know, at least uh, legendary. And so he used those words. I've come to seek the elixir of high growth. And since it is, since it is after six o'clock and we are sort of at, at dinner tables, I can tell you a secret um, about the Japanese. If ever you have to go to Japan to find out something. You see, in Japan, they have two truths. The official truth, tatemai, which means literally facade, the outer appearance, and hone, the inner, the real truth. Now, you initially, certainly the American reaction was, hang on, that's lying. You mean there's two truths that can't be? <coughs> Come on, let's get real. <laughs> that's how it's done everywhere, except in Japan. It's the official, I mean, everyone knows this, and it's socially, culturally accepted. So if you're in a formal meeting, you will always get the official story. Just don't expect the real truth. And when I was young, you know, and, and you know, um, as, a, as a researcher, often Japanese people took pity with me and leaving a formal meeting, they would say, Richard, let's meet for dinner. I'll tell you, the, you know, what's really happening. After six o'clock, it's off the record. And then you find out everyone speaks the truth and they love to speak the truth. So that's, that's the secret on the Japanese. You find out the truth, make sure you meet for dinner. A little bit of sake helps, of course. Um, and they will tell you. And so I can absolutely see how Deng Xiaoping was literally told over those, you know, drinking mo tai and sake, um, how they did it. And how they did it, how did Japan and then also Korea, Taiwan, get this double-digit economic growth? They used central bank guidance of bank credit which they called window guidance, to guide bank credit into that area, bank credit for productive business investment, and restrict bank credit for consumption and for asset purchases. And then you get very high economic growth. That was introduced by the Japanese uh, in 1942 in Japan, which included Korea and Taiwan. You know, Until 1945, Korea and Taiwan had been part of Japan for half a century. And then when they became independent, they decided, oh, this worked really well. We're going to continue this. They continued this in the 50s and 60s and 70s and got also their double-digit economic growth. And that's exactly what Deng Xiaoping did. Now, of course, a precondition for this is that you have enough banks. And he realized that and he was told, well, it's better to have more than one bank. So he came back to China and he created thousands of banks, small banks, local banks, savings banks, credit unions, village banks. Provincial banks, also some national players, but the majority of the almost 5,000 banks in China, of course, are small local banks that only lend in the local area, which is this principle that Japan had introduced originally from Germany. And that's the secret of success also of 200 years of fairly strong economic growth in Germany, which has just ended last October, by the way. But um, anyway, um, so... That's how you get high growth. You, meet, you need many small banks because they lend to small firms. Small firms are important because they're the main employer. Two-thirds of employment in every country, in some countries more than two-thirds, are with small and medium-sized enterprises. And for economic growth, we need to fund this with bank credit. But big banks will not lend to small firms. It doesn't make any sense. So you need small banks, and that's why we need to create small banks community banks, local banks that lend in their local area. And that's also the antidote to what the central planners are trying to do. They're trying to kill banks. The ECB has killed 5,000 banks, mainly small banks, of course, forcing them to merge by having high regulatory costs, constantly increasing regulatory burdens, um, and also the interest rate policies they had for a long time, zero and negative interest rate. Um, and so very anti-bank policies, small banks uh, being driven out. but. Um, it is now extremely profitable to be a bank because interest margins are now very large. Um, and as a small local bank, you know, banking is one of the most profitable industries. And that's what you're getting into with Valhalla Network, with more community banks. Yes, indeed. So I've been, for the last 10 years, working to set up community banks. Um, there was a bit of a struggle, I must say, in the UK, where the regulators just don't want small local banks. Uh, they want, uh, they call them challenger banks, new 
essentially payment banks. They don't give out any loans. They're to just small cherry firms. picking the transaction services. Exactly, transaction services. That's being supported. But if you want to do SME banking, you know, then if you want to set up um, a new bank, there's, there's this bunch of guys from the city. They said, let's set up a new bank for the super rich. Oh, here's the license. They got it within record time, you know, banking license. You only want to... <laughs> but, but community banks actually are good for everyone. This is what they need to realize in the city of London. That's how you create prosperity for everyone. Um, and the thing is, you see, you can have double-digit economic growth in any country, in any region, and for any time period. You can have high and stable growth. So we don't, this is coming back to your earlier question, we don't need the cycles. You can have very high and very stable, non-inflationary, equitable growth. In fact, there's no limit to growth. I mean, this Club of Rome, half a century ago, launched their, their major uh, first book, you know, The Limits to Growth. And this was essentially the beginning of this major campaign against economic activity and prosperity, which is now under the label of climate change. And that's a whole, you know, it's a very related discussion because, of course, it's linked to CBDCs as well. Anyway, so they were starting to make this argument, limits to growth. <laughs> There's no limit to growth. It's a complete misunderstanding. And also, growth is not the enemy of the environment. It's totally impossible. Because ask a physicist, what is, what is growth? What is economic growth? There isn't any growth in a physics sense. It's just a statistical concept. And this, a statistical concept cannot hurt the environment. Now, if you do what they say, oh, let's have zero growth, let's degrowth. So you think that's the end of hurting the environment, environmental destruction, the Amazon won't be cut down anymore? They're still doing it now. In Canada, this woke climate change, whatever government, they're cutting down still these giant 1,000-year-old amazing trees. They're still cutting them down in Canada. That's how much they care about the environment. So with zero growth, you can still have massive environmental destruction. What hurts the environment is environmental destruction, not economic growth. Look at China. When they were poor, they had to look after the high priority, you know, first things first, and, and lift people out of poverty. Thanks to the creation of banks and window guidance, focusing bank credit on implementing you know, credit creation for business investment, China had four decades of double-digit growth, lifting more people out of poverty than any place in history before. And then they started to care about the environment. And they have now very strict environmental protection rules. So just by saying, oh, let's have zero growth, and this is going to somehow you know, be good for the environment, that's complete nonsense, complete misunderstanding. So growth is actually a necessary condition, in my view, to solve the problems of mankind. And I'm really with, with uh, JFK on this one. Um, most of our problems are man-made, and they can be solved by man. So let's do it. And of course, the monetary system is, is a key tool to do that. That's a resource allocation tool. We have to understand it, make it transparent how it really works, and then use it for us. How did the central planners react when I started to publish the truth about banking? Well, um, well princes of the yen. Um, they sent the CIA around to scare me. Then New Paradigm and Macroeconomics came out in 2005. They then started to create these so-called grassroots, I mean AstroTurf grassroots, um, activist groups that said, oh, banks create money. That's terrible. Let's abolish it. And they were supported by the central planners. And they have been launching CBDCs. You know, the CBDC plan since. In other words, now that the public starts to understand how it works, and we could actually utilize this knowledge and this know-how for the greater good, now they want to abolish it because it mustn't get into the wrong hands like the general public. Isn't that extraordinary, outrageous? Um, so that's, of course, another reason why we have to uh, prevent the introduction of CBDCs. Now, CBDCs are programmable. So let's talk about that. Yes, what are your objections to CBDCs and what could be <laughs> how, how could a way one object to, to this? <laughs> so how could you do a CBDC that would be less dangerous to the freedom of the public? Well, by not doing a CBDC. <laughs> That's how you do it. You see, the attraction for the central planners of central bank digital currencies is the programmability. And of course, they're all looking into the programmability. Several have made statements like, oh, we won't use that. 
okay, maybe, you know, in the first generation, they won't use it, but, you know, there's a new central bank governor and uh, whatever, and suddenly they, they are using it. I mean, the fact is they are working very hard on this. In Brazil, they had this, this pilot, um, you know, CBDC, and the, the, there's a, a blockchain programmer who checked out the code and could prove that it already has all the tools in it to freeze your money and to confiscate it, transfer it away without your uh, permission. It's already in the code. Applicable for USDT as well, which is something that might represent the original token. USDT, everybody uses it. And the transaction itself, they could possibly freeze and pull out your money. So exactly. 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 In fact, they're now even moving beyond CBDC. In June uh, this year, the BIS, which is very advanced in its plans for uh, CBDC is also to be used for inter-central bank transactions and so on. Um, they made the announcement that, well, we need to accelerate tokenization of everything. Now, in principle, you know, if you like uh, blockchain and, and the tools, that's sort of, you know, that sounds good. But think about it. It's the wrong guys doing it, isn't it? The, the central bank of the central bankers. And why do they want to tokenize everything? And in the same announcement, they talk about the programmability. And general assets, all assets, bank deposits, should also be tokenized. Because, well, then, at the press of the button, the programmability feature can be used. And, oh, well, um, you've obviously, you know, um, just ignored all their rules on carbon footprints and you've been eating too much beef or whatever it may be, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, so, you know, you have to, you know, your assets have to be transferred, not just your CBDC. They're already starting to talk about going beyond CBDC and linking but it on the But can't you do a CBDC that's not programmable? It, well, even if you can, then, um, then you don't need a CBDC. The whole point is the programmable. And it's, it's very official. The Bank of England has formally, um, officially, publicly, asked the UK government for the legal permission to make it programmable. Think about Canada, Ottawa, where there were peaceful demonstrations against um, you know, the uh, essentially uh, violations of human rights by the government by having all these restrictions. Peaceful demonstrations for weeks and um, Trudeau didn't like it. Um, and so in the end, he managed to get a parliamentary uh, approval to have a new law passed, a draconian law that allows the government to order the banks, all of, and not just the banks, actually all financial institutions, to freeze people's assets. But in a way that really just demonstrated to all of us, you know, the sort of things they've been thinking about. And I'm sure he was very sad that they hadn't managed to roll out CBDCs by that time, because then it would have been even faster. So really what CBDCs are doing is they are usurping a parliamentary democratic prerogative including essentially fiscal policy. You know, how money is spent, that is a parliamentary budgetary prerogative. CBDCs will usurp that and hand it over to the central planners. Now, in many countries, central banks are still privately owned. You know, and historically, they've been created by, you know, the big banking dynasties. You know, it's a, it's a banking cartel that doesn't like small banks. But that's exactly what we need to do. You know, we need to work in the opposite direction. So while the central planners want to increase their power over our lives, and it's literally not just about total surveillance and monitoring of where, we are, where you are and what you're spending your money on, um, it is about this programmability intervention. Um, and if you, you know, don't follow the rules or you've stepped outside the 15-minute um, walking distance area, well, your money is not going to work. So if they manage to introduce CBDCs, if it is inevitable, as some say, how will it end in 10, 20, 50, or 100 years? It is a completely dystopian scenario, and certainly in much shorter time than a century. Absolutely. I mean, just within a decade, I would say. And so we should stop it in the tracks. That's a very important point. It's so dire that we should not even allow pilot projects. We should have demonstrations outside central banks against this. They don't expect this, by the way. And central bankers, unlike politicians, they don't have any thick skin. And so I really want to encourage you to think about what can we do um, 
to safeguard our financial and economic and therefore, you know, essentially general freedom to stop this. Because I noticed, and I was told by one central banker um, who'd seen the CBDC, been shown it by one of the, the major old central banks, they already they were ready to roll it out in 2016, but they didn't. But he was shown it, and, and it was very small. It was a, a little, sort of like a, like a grain of rice to be implanted subcutaneously under your skin. And they never talk about that, What's, what is it going to look like, right? And I was quite shocked by the fact that the realization, wow, it's ready, ready, they can roll it out any time. So I started to speak up in 2016 in my... <laughs> Uh, conference presentations and some written, um, you know, articles and so on. And it seems that they then delayed because they realized there is a bit of a hurdle, particularly with the implant thing, you know, uh, because it is a violation of human dignity, no doubt. So they've delayed. Now, next, they introduced this um, COVID PSYOP. Now, I know this is another controversial topic. I'm, I'm from a medical family. To me, this, you know, it's a fairly clear cut. Um, but we don't need to go into details. The fact is, um, they, you know, we had this COVID rollout. You know, and, and you know why was this, uh, you know, Jackson Hole plan, BlackRock? Why was it even there at that time already, August two thousand nineteen? And there was a second speech by Mark Carney, my former um, fellow student, same year at Oxford, M. Phil Economics. I mean, he did the boring stuff, Goldman Sachs back office. Come on, <laughs> but. You know, he clearly played along with the game and did well for him, as, as you do when you play along in the game. Um, anyway, so he gave the other speech at that conference, namely about the need to introduce CBDCs and link them globally to have a world currency. <laughs> that was also August 2019. And then in, in March 2020, they introduced this, timed, of course, with the lockdowns. So there is a direct link to COVID um, measures. And central banks came out, including the Bank of England, in March 2020, talking about, oh, we must accelerate the introduction of CBDCs, you know, public event, public um, discussion paper and all that. Um, and, um, and, of course, the idea then was, very clearly, with hindsight, that's, that's visible, they wanted to launch the digital ID, which is a precondition for um, a properly working CBDC, the way they, they want to introduce it. What we've seen is they, they delayed they sort of ran this different operation thinking, okay, that will accelerate it ultimately, but it's done the opposite. What I've experienced is when I spoke about CBDCs and the dangers of CBDCs in 2016, 17, 18, very few people were even interested. Very few people cared. Some, you know, saw the point and realized, okay, but, you know, that's in some distant future. Now, at conferences, everyone is really interested and they, they really literally woke up. I mean, I know so many doctors and people in the medical field now who understand that it's actually about financial control. And everyone is now interested in CBDCs. So they made a strategic mistake, and that makes me optimistic. You know, we have already succeeded in delaying it. They made mistakes. And I think if we are now active enough, we can prevent it. It's possible. Right now, especially in the US and in Europe, like it's it's the best time to implement CBDCs now in the in, in the next years because inflation is not coming down. Right? Uh, people have real problems. Like people are struggling to pay. I mean, you're from Germany, right? You know the situation: electricity, gas, housing. Everything is so expensive. Like. It's the best time for them now. And that's why, like at the point where right now, how can we stop that? Yes. Yes, they will certainly try. Um, but we must make clear our opposition. Central bankers have um, much thinner skin and they don't um, they don't handle direct opposition very well from the general public. They're very afraid of that. So that's what we need to mobilize, I think. Um, but in terms of the, their plans, I mean, I'm sure the plan is particularly for Germany. Um, I mean, the, the, the ECB has created now a property bubble in Germany since 2009. Um, it ended in um, last October, a year ago. 
um, and it's now in a slow motion implosion, which if you don't take the right policies as a central bank, will take the banking system with it. In Japan, we've seen this can take two decades, <laughs> but that's entirely a policy variable, so the timing. I would, I would have thought it will probably take two, three years, and then that will be, I think, where the ECB will try to roll out, you know, have the banking crisis, and then roll out the CBDCs, and then people want to switch to CBDCs, and then, oh, we're successful. That probably is the plan, but the more we realize that's the plan, you know, the more we can take countermeasures. And since 2020 accelerated everywhere, the number of businesses or even government agencies that say no more cash. Um, but you can mobilize people against this. I mean, you know the, the case of the, the French um, various local areas where supermarket, big supermarkets suddenly said no more cash. And then the locals got together and said, listen guys, we've got to fight for this. And so they did the following. They all went into the supermarket and filled up their trolleys with things that they, you know, would buy, but perhaps, you know, two months worth or whatever in one go. Why not? And they go to the checkout and they have only cash with them. All of them did it. And then, oh, you're, you're not accepting this? Okay, well, here's, here's the money, legal tender. What? You don't want it? Okay, then I must go. And so then they had all these full trolleys and then... Of course, all the staff complained to headquarters, and so then they reversed the policy. They're arguing opinion. Yeah, it reminds me of the quote. <laughs> if you're willing to give up freedom for comfort, you deserve neither. And that leads me to, if you are dependent on the government for your survival, for your food, you're not going to put up much resistance for CBDCs. Yes, and of course, that's the link to UBI, you know, uh, universal basic income. As I said already, 2016, they're going to push that. In fact, then already suddenly, at that time, 2016, all these billionaires came out and said, uh, we believe we should have universal basic income. Now, that idea is 100 years old. It was considered socialist, communist. Why do these billionaires suddenly favor it? Well, because now we have the technology for CBDCs. That's why. <laughs> and it'll be the carrot, the bribe, to accept the implant. Oh, sorry, you know, to get this thousand uh, dollars, thousand pounds a month, or whatever it may be, you know, you need to use the technology. I hear that there's food that's getting cold. Shall we get some food and continue the discussion? All right. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>